We're blessed this morning to look back and see you in the audience. We do have visitors and a uh, whole bench full back there in the back and uh, throughout the building. I, I was a little worried about it being a Labor Day weekend, the holiday. Afraid a lot of our folks would be camping and some of them are and gone on trips, but we've got enough visitors to make up a loop. We have a, about 200 here in worship and that's encouraging. And you make it possible. Thank you for being here today. And I uh, hope and pray that, uh, Lord willing, that you can come back and be with us any time you possibly can. Uh, we'll have another thought or two to express at the end. I'll uh, read a couple of cards and uh, emphasize a couple of points, but uh, we'll save that for the end. Thank you for being here today. The lesson this morning is titled, um, Some Biblical Facts About Sin some biblical facts about sin. Uh, most of us are probably like the little boy when it comes to sin that I heard about a long time ago. Uh, this is a new sermon, but I'm going to use an old illustration. This little fellow's mama was sick. They lived close to the church building back in the time when people walked to church a lot. And she was sick, but she wanted him to go on anyway to church. And then right next to the church, there was a big area where a lot of boys played ball, and some were playing ball, and some of them were his buddies and neighborhood friends and they wanted him to play ball with them and so he did instead of going to church. He sort of watched when everybody started leaving and the church building and he headed on home. I guess by the look of his clothes and such, they'd been playing football and it's pretty obvious that he had not been to church to his wise mother. And so she asked him, said, well, what did the preacher preach on today? Well, that, that put him in a tight place there. He thought a minute and he said, what did the preacher preach on? He said, I believe he preached on sin. He preached on sin. And his mama came back and said, well, what did he say about it? And he said, boy, what did he say about it? I believe he was against it. And he said, <laughs> he was against it. He was against it. Um, I guess most of us, that's sort of the way we view sin. We, we know it's bad. It's something we need to be again, again it. Uh, something that um, is not the right direction. Uh, in uh, Luke chapter 18, when Jesus taught about two men went to pray, one was arrogant and praised God for how much he gave and fasted and how good he was and not like that old publican over there. That was the Pharisee talking. The publican, though, a great example to us when it comes to recognizing sin, uh, he would not lift his eyes up toward heaven because he didn't feel like he was worthy. I, I, many of us can identify with that. But he just smote his breast and he, looking down, no doubt, said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What does that mean, to be a sinner? What are some biblical facts about sin? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Sometimes, you know, it's written in Hezekiah or somewhere that preachers are supposed to lead prayer during gospel meetings. And so when we go to visit, sometimes they ask me to lead prayer. And sometimes I just pray, and it's sort of uh, folks haven't figured it out yet, but I just say, Father... Please um, be merciful unto us that are sinners. In Jesus' name, amen. And, you know, they're used to praying for the military and for the missionaries and the elders and deacons and for uh, all the sick and afflicted. And that's important and needs to be prayed about from time to time, but not every time. And I wish we could have more of a humble attitude like this publican just to recognize we're sinners. And most of all, we need forgiveness of our sins. Be merciful unto us, O God, because we're sinners. So we're thinking about some biblical facts about sin. One biblical fact is this morning, sin separates us from God. I hear people talking from time to time that they don't feel as close to God as they used to. Or they feel like that maybe there's, there's not that, there's just something missing in their relationship to God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Let's look at this verse. I think it tells us really well. The Lord's hand's not shortened that He cannot save. You know, He's not, I can't reach Him. He, he's not able to help me anymore. No, He is not. His arm's not any shorter. Uh, neither is ear heavy that He cannot hear you. That's not the problem. Here's the problem. Iniquity is separated between you and your God. Iniquities. And then another word for iniquity is sins. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So one of our problems in regard to we feel like maybe we're not as close to God is the problem of sin in our life. Sin hides his face from us that he doesn't hear our prayers. Sin, iniquities or sins separate us from God. So 
That's fact number one, what sin does. It separates us from God. John 9 and 31, the blind man said, Of a truth, we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worse for him, do this will him he heareth. God doesn't hear sinners' prayers. So if you feel like you're not as close to God, uh, look and think and evaluate, am I living in sin? Am I doing sinful things uh, in, that I need to repent of and change about and quit doing those things? Not that I'm going to be perfect or sinless. We'll cover that in just a moment. But that in regard to the power of, of sin in our lives is that God doesn't hear sinners so if there's a problem, maybe we're still, uh, we need to separate some things, repent of some things, change some things in our lives as we battle. Uh, and it's a constant battle. I appreciated Don Goff's prayer. Don was said, you know, it's a battle that continues on and on and on. And yes, it does. As long as we live, we're going to be battling temptations and sins. All of us are. So uh, if we feel like that God's not hearing us, are we sinners? That may be the problem. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, but the ears and his ears are open unto their prayers, the righteous, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That's probably what our problem is. Another fact about biblical facts about sin, I guess we need to establish what is sin. What are, you talk, what are we talking about here? What is sin? First of all, the Bible says that sin is a transgression of the law of God, the will of God, the Word of God. We've got 1 John uh, 3 and verse 4, defines it very well. Verse 4, said 14. Uh, can you pull up verse 4? Uh, sin is a transgression of the law. And uh, that's about as good a description as you can think for. Here's God's law, here's God's Word, here's what He said. And when we sin, we're missing the mark. We're not doing the things that God has said. Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. They had that beautiful home in a garden, such a beautiful place. They had everything they could possibly want. Every tree was for food. And uh, got one tree, stay away from it, not as good and evil. But all this beautiful garden was theirs. And uh, they walked with God in the cool of the day. What a beautiful picture of harmony and good. But they, the old devil came along and they listened to him and they got out of harmony with God. They, didn't, they, they did the devil's will instead of God's will and so they lost their home. And they were separated from God, the unity that they had of walking with God before. What is sin? It's violating the laws of God, the will of God. And that's what Adam and Eve did. Listen to um, the reference in... Uh, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, uh, speaks of the relationship we need to have with our Lord. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that be Adam and Eve, death came by sin. So death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And um, for unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even to them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For through the offense of one, many be dead, much more by the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Um, the reading continues for many verses of Paul describing what sin does. It is a rebellion to God, to God's will. It's not walking with the Lord. And Adam and Eve is our example of that. What is sin? Uh, James 4 and 17 helps us to understand what sin is. For therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So there is a sin of commission going against the laws of God. Verse 7, 3, 4. Then there's a saw, sin of omission, knowing to do good things and not doing it. That's sinful when it's the good things of God. And we, we need to look in context of what um, uh, Brother James is talking about here in James chapter 4. What good things are you thinking of, James? Well, I'm thinking of, like in verse 7 in context, that we submit ourselves unto God, resist the devil. I'm thinking about verse 8, that we draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to us. Cleanse your hands. That's what I'm thinking about, good things. What about 
Verse 9, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord that he may lift you up. See, in context, verses 7 through 10 told us those good things. Now, in verse 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, what good thing? Draw nigh to God, resist the devil, uh, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. If you do these good things, then we ought to do those good things. If we do not, then we have sinned. What is sin? Um, 1 John 5 and verse uh, 17 tells us that sin is an act of unrighteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. So any situation whereby we're doing things that are not right before God, we've, we're wrong. We need to repent. We need to ask God to forgive us as Christians that we could be doing right. Another fact about sin is, we've already alluded to it a little bit, but all of us have sin. And all of us do sin from time to time. Your parents, your Bible teachers, your preachers, your elders, your deacons, we all sin. Not proud of it, ashamed of it. Wish we could say we never did or never would, but we are human beings. And so sometimes we say things we shouldn't say and we do things we shouldn't do. We all sin according to the scriptures. In John 8 and verse 7, when they brought the adulterous woman to Jesus, what was it that he told the men that were circled around him wanting to stone her for her adultery? He said, let him that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. All right? Pick your stones up and throw them, man, if you are without sin. Well, from the oldest to the youngest, they all left. Verse 11, then, Jesus looked to the woman and he said, Woman, where are no man hath accused you, where are thine accusers? No man, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. The challenge was, you can do better than this, do better, but he was not going to condemn her for the sin in her past. We all sin. Romans 3 and 23, for we have all sinned and come and fallen short of the glory of God. First John 1 and verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Do you ever deceive yourself? You, you live in denial. It's called the land of denial. Uh, you deceive yourself to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Or you deceive yourself because you're doing sinful things and you think that it's all right. Or I know one preacher that said he was working 60 hours a week uh, for the Lord and that he felt like he just had a right to do sinful things. No, you don't have a right to do sinful things. And that's just an exception of yourself to yourself. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and we need to understand that we do sin and therefore we do need forgiveness or repentance. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, that ought to make us do some more thinking about when we're jumping on to other people or pointing a finger at other people in judgmental statements and we're really telling them off. We're really putting them in their place. Do we ever stop to think about that we too have sin in our lives? Are we perfect? No. Are we sinless? No. So I don't understand the ability. I think it is a deception. People are deceived if they can feel free just to jump on somebody else and just wear them out about the way they're living. Do they not ever look within their own life? Let him that's without sin first cast a stone. Folks, you can't pick up rocks. Hey, ain't nobody in here can pick a rock up. Not a one of us. So, we can be deceived. We all sin, and it does happen. Another fact is, angels sin. Some of you know that, but that's what the Bible says. I don't know exactly when that was. I've studied and thought about it somewhat. But I do know the Bible says there was a time when angels sin. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. The Greek word for hell here is not Hades, and it's not Gehenna, everlasting hell. But it's the only time this is used in the New Testament. It is the Greek word Tartarus, from which we get the English word torments. I'm in torments, the rich man said in Luke 16. The angels that sinned were cast down to torment, that part of the Hadean world, and delivered into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. There was a time when angels sinned. 
And the chief angel among them that sinned was Lucifer, or the devil. He was the chief one that sinned. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6. In regard to the qualifications for elders, it says you should not pick an elder that is a novice because lest being lifted up with pride, they fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now listen to that verse. Elders, don't, you don't get some new on fire Christian and make him an elder real quickly. He's a novice, he's a new Christian. No, he needs to be seasoned and tried and make sure that he's a good, solid man. He might be lifted up with pride like the old devil was, condemnation of the devil was. He was a fallen angel, a beautiful one, Lucifer, and he was lifted up with pride. Don't put a man in that situation and don't pick a man that would go into that situation. But the point is the devil fell as a fallen angel that occurred. And that's why he's here on earth and tempts us and tries to deceive us and to bring us down. Look at 1 John 3 and verse 8 is a good reference in regard to the effects of Satan and his work. 1 John 3 and verse 8 he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the devil is a fallen angel. The devil is a sinner from the beginning. And he tries to deceive and get us to sin and do wrongful things. Next fact about biblical facts about sin is the fact that all sins are known to God. God knows. Now, we may commit some sins that folks don't know about. Um, be sure your sins will find you out. It's from Numbers 30 32, verse 23. There were two tribes, Reuben and Gad, when they got to the Promised Land, they liked the land for their cattle on the east side of the Jordan River. All the major developments and settling by the children of Israel was on the west side of the Jordan River. They said, we like this side better. We'd like to go over here, Moses. Moses said, you can't do that. We've got many a battle up front of us to clean out and clear out the land of the heathen, and we need your help, and it wouldn't be right for you to do that. They said, we promise that we will support you, and we will battle with you, and we will not go in and make our homes there until the enemies have been driven out. That's when Moses said, okay, if you don't do what you've said, you promised us that you will help us until the land's cleared. Now, if you don't do that, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. God knows. God, um, God won't forget it. So be sure your sins will find you out. Sin will be made known, is known to God. God will make known what He wants to be made known in sinful things. I believe that. Whatever God believes He needs to be known, He will make known. But He knows. Not fooling God. God heard Adam and Eve when they had that conversation with the devil. It didn't broke his heart, but He heard them because He enjoyed walking with them in the cool of the day. He saw Cain lift up and strike his brother Abel a death blow and cover his body up, the bloody body. He saw Achan sneak into his tent, and dig a hole and put the gold and silver and the Babylonian garments and cover them up. He heard Ananias and Sapphira lie about how much they gave to God in regard to the property they sold. He heard it all. He sadly heard Peter curse and swear that he never knew the Lord. God hears it all. God sees it all. Can't fool God. So that's a fact about sin. Sins are known to God. A fact is, sins are not inherited. That is a major false doctrine in the religious world, that you and we inherit sins. No, we can be affected by the sins of others uh, through abuse of alcohol or drugs or uh, such things. We may suffer the effects, but no, we won't have to suffer the consequences. We won't have to answer for those things. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth 
it shall die, the soul that sinneth. And, Romans 14 and 12, everyone shall give an account of himself unto God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11, for we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that that he hath done. That's how judgment's going to be. I will not be judged by my father nor my mother nor you. But we will be judged by our own lives. The things that we have done, according to that, we shall be judged. So that's a false doctrine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Another fall or a fact about, biblical fact about sin is, there is what's called an unpardonable sin or an unforgivable sin. That's from Mark 3, verses 28 and 29. Mark 3, 28 and 29, Jesus said, I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, blasphemies wherewith soever they should, shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. What not you say, Lord? All sins shall be forgiven except the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost. There are some who believe we can't be guilty of that today, but that it was mainly for the Pharisees and the scribes and their rejection of Jesus and rebellion to Him and putting the Lord down and not accepting Him in their hardness of hearts that they did not repent of such and therefore they were lost. Remember the first part of the statement was all sins are forgiven. And when John wrote to the Christians in 1 John 1 and 9, he says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All sins are forgiven that Christians confess. That's the problem with the unpardonable sin. The unforgivable sin is that people have a hard heart and a seared conscience or seared heart and they won't, they're unwilling to admit it. They're unwilling to ask God to forgive them. Or they don't believe there is a God. They rebel against, they blaspheme Jesus Christ that He does not exist. And, and they don't believe and they become so hard-hearted that they reject that knowledge. They could be forgiven if they would obey the gospel. They could be forgiven as an erring Christian if they would be restored and confess their sin. God be merciful unto me a sinner. But the fact is they don't think they are a sinner. They don't think there is a God. And they don't care that they're in rebellion to Him. Their heart is hardened. But sins are forgiven for Christians when they repent. One other fact about sin is it does bring short-lived pleasure. Sin does have within it short-lived pleasures. Our text says Hebrews 11 and verse 25 talking about Moses. It says of him in regard that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The pleasures sin has within it pleasures, but they're only for a short season. Then lasts very long. And uh, <laughs> the thing about Moses was, it goes ahead to say that he had regard to the recompense of the reward. When Moses compared, all right, here's what's to be gained if I sin, and here's and what's to be lost, and here's what's to be gained if I serve the Lord. And, and when he compared them, there was no comparison. There was no comparison. The greater value was God and serving God has eternal rewards. Sin has pleasure for just a short time. Serving God has eternal ramifications. So that's a very important fact about sin. When the old devil tries to deceive us, and sin is deceiving, and Revelation 20 and 10 says the devil that deceived them was cast a lake of fire. When the old devil's working on us, trying to deceive us, then we need to remember that the promise is that our sins will find us out, that they're not worth this short season, but have eternal replications. You listen very kindly. We've covered a lot of scripture, and I've left out a lot of scripture, in fact. But I wanted to share with you the importance of some biblical facts about what the Bible says about sin. Remember we began with, God be merciful to me a sinner. Let's say in Romans 6 and 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's your decision. It's rebellion to God. It's going against the will of God, not listening to the word of God, 
It's transgressing the law. It's not knowing to do good and doing it not. It's acts of unrighteousness, unfaithfulness to His will. Where do we stand today? Where do we stand? Are you a sinner? Would you humbly ask God to forgive you? That means if you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to confess your faith, repent of your sins, and be baptized this morning. Or if you need to be restored to the Lord as an erring Christian, one who's been faithful but gone back, if we confess our faults, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's your decision, but I hope as we sing this song of invitation that you'll think about it seriously and these biblical facts about sin. We all sin, but the good news is we've got a Savior who forgives. While we stand, while we sing.